unabashed. The most unpredictable becomes a headline. The most volatile outrageous behavior. Unsubstantiated narratives. A battle of personalities. Welcome to Grant Tamasha, a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindu Sun Times. I'm your host, Milan Vaishnav. We are excited to kick off the 11th season today with a return guest to the podcast. The third way India's revolutionary approach to data governance is an important new book by the lawyer, scholar, and author Rahul Matan. Rahul joined us last year to discuss India's new personal data protection bill, but today he's back to talk about India's unique approach to building digital public infrastructure, an ecosystem that can have transformative impact at home, but also build partnerships for India abroad. Rahul is a partner at the law firm Trilegal, where he heads their technology practice. And over the past several years, he has worked closely with government, most recently as a special advisor to the Ministry of Finance during India's G20 presidency. To talk more about his new book and India's digital transformation, Rahul joins me from his office in Bangalore. Rahul, nice to see you again. It's lovely to be here. And uh, congratulations on 10 seasons. Thank you very much. And we are excited to kick off this latest one with you. Um, Let me just take us right to the book. Uh, You open up this book by noting that, you know, there is this literature on India's digital revolution, but that literature has largely positioned this massive series of changes we've seen over the past 10 or 20 years in India as a digital transformation story. But one of the main themes of your book is that, look, within these digital systems, there's a robust data governance framework, which is at work, maybe you don't even realize it, which embeds legal and regulatory objectives directly into code. So, you know, this is where I would like to start this conversation. Tell us a little bit about why India's digital revolution is more than just, you know, greater access to bank accounts, better forms of identification and mobile applications. What else is going on that maybe we've been missing? So, look, I mean, I think the the point is that it is all of those things. It is, in fact, a remarkable uh, digital transformation. And I think in the course of my analysis of this, and I've been working closely on the sidelines of this for over a decade and a half, it you know, a lot of the questions that were asked around this were questions around, you know, what is the governance of this of this system? And of course, there were answers to it, which is, you know, we've got legislations, we've got notifications, we've got regulations. But as I looked closer at the actual technology, what was obvious to me was embedded within the technology, embedded within the infrastructure, were principles that were actually very similar to what you'd see in legislations like, for instance, the GDPR, uh, which is the General Data Protection Regulation around privacy. And it occurred to me that there there was a way, and of course, I'm not the first person to say this. Uh, over 20 years ago, Lawrence Lessig wrote a wonderful book called Code and the Other Laws of Cyberspace, where he said that in the internet, it is possible to actually regulate using protocols because all of the internet responds to to APIs and protocols and, and things like that. And and if you want to regulate the, the internet and we regulate all of the digital sphere, we could do it using protocols um, by shaping the behavior uh, of the various participants of these ecosystems just by the actual uh, code that they have to, by default, comply with. And as I looked at India's digital public infrastructure from that lens, it seemed to me that we had embedded a lot of the principles of various regulations, um, you know, security, uh, cybersecurity uh, uh, elements, uh, privacy elements, perhaps even elements that could help with competition and consumer protection, we'd embedded all of those directly into the infrastructure in a number of ways, Um, you know, through the design uh, of the infrastructure, uh, through the, through the way in which these, uh, these infrastructure had been rolled out um, using a a unique public private uh, combination and, and also through the institutions that uh, were responsible for managing all of this. And so really that's what the book talks about uh, in, in some detail. It, it gets into this concept uh, of, first of all, building out digital public infrastructure, but ensuring that that digital public infrastructure responds to fundamental principles of the laws and regulations that apply to the sectors within, within which, which they operate. You know, in, in thinking through how the world has tried to frame regulation 
uh, to mitigate, you know, concerns about, you know, privacy, surveillance, various breaches. Uh, in the book, you talk about sort of two seminal kind of prevailing models, right? And in many ways, these models are polar opposites of one another. On the one hand, you have the kind of laissez-faire, you know, kind of Wild West model of the United States where it seems that anything goes. Uh, and then you have on the other end of the spectrum, a kind of regulatory intensive model of the European Union and their GDPR regulations, which you just uh, referenced. Maybe you could just kind of start out before we get deep into the India model, giving us a sketch about these two ideal types. How do they work and how are they different? Sure. And look, I think none of what uh, what we have achieved with digital um, and uh, perhaps where we are right now would have existed or happened if we actually did not have these two models. So let me be completely clear that this is in no way uh, is some sort of a denigration of either of the, of the models. I think when the internet was first formed, when it was, when it was growing, um, we needed the laissez-faire approach uh, that the U.S. Uh, adopted. And you know, essentially what the U.S. said was that this is a new nascent industry. It needs some sort of protection. Uh, and the forefront of that in, in many ways was Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, um, which essentially gave an exemption to internet businesses from the sorts of liabilities that would otherwise have visited those businesses uh, if they were the traditional brick and mortar business. And, and that gave those businesses sort of air cover um, to grow uh, and develop into what we now know uh, as large internet uh, businesses. But it also gave rise to this concept of internet exceptionalism, the, the idea that the internet is a different place than um, the regular offline world. And so it needs some special dispensations. And from Section 230, various other uh, areas of law uh, also uh, deployed a certain, certain level of protection to these businesses. And as a result of that, we started seeing certain harms that society uh, was, was suffering as a result, and we don't need to get into all of that, but in many ways, the regulatory heavy approach um, that Europe proposed was uh, a, uh, a sort of a, a way to counteract some of the uh, excesses uh, that resulted from uh, you know, the way in which uh, the US had allowed uh, internet businesses to grow freely. And so the European approach is very much defined by what you can and cannot do uh, in various domains. And, and Europe has uh, consistently maintained a very um, uh, strong regulatory focus uh, on the internet and digital, and it continues to do so, uh, even as recently as late last year when uh, the, they arrived at an agreement on how to regulate uh, AI through the AI Act. So, so these two uh, approaches, and once again, I want to give uh, a full credit to other uh, authors and scholars who have spent a lot of time on this. Anu Bradford has an, has an exceptional book called Digital Empires, where she talks about these two, and she also talks about uh, the Chinese model. Uh, and so these, uh, 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 this analysis of the different ways in which regulation uh, take place uh, is not something that I'm contributing newly uh, to the space. I think I think the, the the new contribution, in a sense, is India's approach uh, and India's particular uh, techno legal approach, um, which uh, you know I think is is a new and novel way to think about regulation, uh, where uh, both these two approaches haven't worked. You know, I, sh I, I suppose that I should step back for a second and maybe ask you to walk us through. What some of the risks are that regulation is meant to to minimize, right? So it kind of gets to the question of why we need regulation in the first place. One of the things you point out in the book is that, you know, there's this, been this voluminous debate around data and data technology. And if you kind of boiled it down, it, it would turn out to be a debate around three things when we think about, you know, the risks that technology poses. The first is surveillance risk of new technology. Uh, number two, the extent to which new technology poses a privacy risk. And three, something that we're hearing about a lot uh, in, in recent months is the harm that humans could face from automated technology like artificial intelligence. Um, I, I think most of our listeners will be pretty familiar with these three concerns, but I wonder if you could just kind of quickly summarize what we should legitimately be worried about uh, before we think about the kind of regulation we need. 
Yeah, so I, you know, I, and and perhaps it's a, it's an oversimplification, but I thought this is a good frame of reference um, uh, without sort of excluding other kinds of harms that 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 could occur. And and so you know, surveillance essentially comes out of the fact that as more and more of our lives uh, are digitally defined, uh, the 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 entities or or the intermediaries that have access to digital information about us will also be able um, to to in a sense see our every move and our every action. Uh, this could be governments that have um, control over uh, public digital infrastructure. It could be private sector organizations that uh, have that control just because of the nature of the service that, that they offer and the fact that so many of us depend on those services. And so surveillance is, is one uh, element. And I, I guess the one of the natural corollaries of a surveillance focus is that uh, these entities that have the ability to conduct the surveillance can misuse that uh, to violate uh, our privacy. And, and so privacy is, a, uh, is almost a, a natural consequence of that. And then as more and more of us, for very often for reasons of convenience or uh, whatever other benefits they offer, submit ourselves to automated decisions. Um, and, and sometimes we do this thinking that all it would do is to is perhaps provide us recommendations of a movie to watch or a book to read, um, end up being subject to various types uh, of harms. Um, and, and many authors have talked about this. Uh, Shoshana Zuboff has talked about surveillance capitalism. Uh, Tristan Harris talks about the attention economy and how you know, we're, we're forced um, uh, to keep uh, watching things or or engaging with platforms um, because the currency of the new world is is our attention, uh, and uh, you know Ellie Pasa talks about things like echo chambers. All of these cause us unique uh, types of harms that are uh, they're unique because they would not have existed if it wasn't for this digital environment that we're all completely immersed in. And so I think those three things um, would be top of mind in terms of the harms that you would want to mitigate uh, through any sort of governance uh, framework. And, and any governance framework needs to keep these in mind uh, as it looks to, to provide solutions. Let's kind of bring this conversation now uh, into the kind of Indian context. And, and one of the main arguments of the book is that, look, the Indian model, as it's evolved over time, offers us a powerful third way that avoids perhaps some of the pitfalls associated with both the U.S. and the European models. And before we kind of get to some of the design principles associated with India's model, I want to just ask you a little bit about India's digital public infrastructure story. You know, uh, again, I think most of our listeners are familiar with the term DPI, India's DPI approach at some sort of macro level of abstraction. They might not be able to explain it kind of if you put them on the spot. Uh, tell us a little bit about how we unpack the kind of essential ingredients, what you call the layers of India's DPI approach. Yeah, and once again, this is an, another, it's a frame of reference to to uh, think about this. And essentially, the way I, I describe India's DPI journey, and I think that this is perhaps universally applicable to any country that would go down this path, uh, is in three essential layers. Um, there is access, engagement, and empowerment, and I'll, I'll take you through each of them. The access layer in India was uh, India's identity, uh, digital identity program uh, called Aadhaar, uh, which you know, other in, in in Hindi means foundation, and uh, very uh, aptly, it is in fact the foundation for everything that comes after that. But it is the access layer because it provided uh, 1.3 billion Indians a digital identity. And really, the important thing was not that it was biometrically deduplicated, but the fact that it was in fact a digital identity, that it was capable of being queried, uh, accessed, used uh, through an API. Uh, and and this is the first layer of any digital public infrastructure stack because it allows a population uh, to uh, sort of a gateway into what is to come next. And what comes next is is what I call the engagement layer. And in, and in India, it's epitomized by the uh, universal payment interface or UPI, uh, which is the absolutely ubiquitous payment uh, a, interface in the country. Um, Almost everyone in the country uh, today uses UPI for almost every type of payment. Uh, I think other than the really, really uh, high-value transactions, almost every payment can be carried out uh, using UPI. And, and like UPI, there are many other uh, elements of this engagement layer of the stack. 
Why engagement? Well, once you've got an identity, you then want to interact with other people who also have a similar um, uh, a similar access into the ecosystem. And the payments interface is one way in which you can do that. There are many other ways in which you can do that. We've got uh, ONDC, uh, which is a, an open network for digital commerce. That's another way to you know layer your payment stack with your commerce stack in order to be able to buy and sell things in a completely decentralized way um, without relying on a central platform that allows you to do that. And like that, there are many other systems uh, of, of engagement and interaction in, in the digital sphere. And once you have engaged for a period of time, you lay down a digital trail and you can, uh, if you don't have access more generally to all of the benefits um, that that others uh, who are more privileged uh, in Indian society have, you could perhaps use those digital trails to empower you in ways like, for instance, uh, as I say in the book, uh, to avail of a loan or uh, to avail of some sort of a service. Now, the reason why this is important, this is probably not universally important, but the reason why it's particularly important in India is because of the disparity in Indian uh, in, in 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 the society in India, and uh, and in the book, I you know I, I reference the fact that there are three Indias. It's just the first India, which is a very large um, number of people. It's three hundred million people, close to the size of the population of the United States. But that is the part of India that uh, is capable of engaging and interacting in the way that I guess most uh, developed countries uh, can. That leaves out a billion people um, that perhaps don't have uh, this benefit. And, and the empowerment layer of the digital public infrastructure stack is really aimed at these people. Um, it's, a, it's a way to allow them to use their digital engagement, um, the interactions that they do using their pay, the payments network, using the commerce network, and all of those other things, to perhaps offer some sort of digital uh, evidence uh, of uh, their ability to pay or their their, um, their their ability to engage in commerce, which could be used as a signal of creditworthiness by some fintech company or or, or some company that's that's willing to use that um, uh, as uh, evidence of creditworthiness. Now these are people who otherwise would not have been able to uh, access credit, um, and we are through this this mechanism empowering them with their own data so that they can use that data uh, to perhaps gain access to, to credit and, and better their lives. And so I think uh, these three layers of the, of the stack, at, at least from, from the lens that I'm looking at, uh, is a way to think about digital public um, infrastructure. It's not that one needs to follow the other or there's any specific sequence or, or anything like that. I think uh, countries enter this, um, th this, this continuum, as it were, depending on what their requirements are, what, what their particular circumstances are. This is the path that India took for various reasons. Um, and, and I think it neatly buckets the various uh, elements of DPI into, into these three ways of looking at it uh, in order to also then think about how to regulate and govern it. You know, one of the key features of the Indian model is that it's built on a series of open access protocols uh, which you argue allows for an approach that rests on sort of several modular interoperable building blocks that uh, have come to be known as India Stack. And I just want to pause for a second on the language that you use because you emphasize in a couple of places uh, that this uh, Indian model, this Indian tech stack is built on a series of protocols and protocols are uh, different from platforms. Tell us why that distinction is important. The problem with platforms is that, um, so look, there, there are many benefits to platforms. Um, and I think that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of what we take away from technology today is because we, uh, you know, we, there are platforms that provide those things to them. Um, and so network effects are extraordinarily powerful. Uh, it allows buyers and sellers to uh, to come to a particular place um, for for buyers who otherwise would not have met the seller's for their niche product, to actually have a market for them, uh, and things like that. But as much as all of these benefits exist uh, in platforms, uh, it allows the concentration um, uh, of power uh, in the hands of singular platforms that then go to dominate not just the country, but also the, the world. And 
And in that, there are uh, some competition harms that we are all um, that are all evident to us, uh, and the the uh, there, there are other perhaps hidden harms that are not so uh, obvious to us. And so the idea is, or, or the thinking was, is there a way in which we can get the benefits uh, that platforms offer us uh, through through another uh, mechanism? that doesn't result in this sort of concentration and dependence on a single intermediary that that manages uh, the uh, the entire say commerce stack and that idea was uh, to use to use protocols and protocols are uh, part of all of india stack essentially uh, a, a way it's, it's these are digital ways to describe connections that can be made between disparate entities and in the open network for digital commerce it allows buyers and sellers without the need to intermediate transactions through a central platform to engage with each other. It also allows various new combinations uh, of different types of services that would otherwise not be possible when you're relying on a platform because the only way you work in a platform uh, economy is when you do exactly as the platform tells you to do. There's, there's a particular predetermined way in which you can engage with the platform and that is the predetermined way in which everyone engages with the platform. It, it limits the amount of creative reinterpretations of the various uh, commercial transactions that are possible. So using protocols has this benefit. And I think, you know, you mentioned building blocks. That's also very key uh, to the protocol approach. Um, you can actually layer different elements of the stack one on top of the other in different ways. You can daisy chain them in different ways to uh, to arrive at conclusions and and you know outcomes that you that you want because you are doing this. And I think you know uh, COVID put a lot of pressure on all countries around the world uh, to spin up new solutions uh, in very short uh, timescales. And I think it was quite obvious that the countries that had digital public infrastructure in place, that had these building blocks in place, could very quickly spin up solutions to this uh, this extreme situation that we were all dealing with in a way that uh, was actually more effective and, and and i think it's really at times of emergency that these sorts of this sort of resilient architecture uh, is extremely important Hey, Grant the Masha listeners. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Putting this show together each week is a labor of love, but it takes a lot of work to put out a great show every week. If you'd like to support the work we do at Grant the Masha, please visit ceip.org slash donate. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or on your favorite podcasting platform, so you'll be the first to know when a new episode rolls out. So could, could I just ask you kind of one follow-up on, on this point, which is in discussing the importance of protocols as opposed to platforms and, and, and how that thinking is embedded in the Indian model, you also talk about the unique relationship in the Indian case between three entities, right? The state or government, uh, the private sector, and the kind of nonprofit sector. And I'm wondering if you could just help our listeners understand you know, how do you think about the contributions of these three kind of legs of a, of a stool, uh, if, 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 if you think about it that way, in the, in the creation of these protocols, right? What is the relative role or contribution of these three key actors? It depends from, you know, from DPI to DPI. But look, I, I think um, the, the reason why the government very often needs to be involved in, in situations like this is because we know that if we leave it to the private sector and the private sector alone, the private sector is it responds to commercial imperatives. I don't want to say shareholder imperatives, but just you know any stakeholder, um, wh whatever it is that uh, I I I the the private sector entity is created um, uh, to respond to. Those are the incentives that that they respond to, and very often these are not res incentives that are aligned with what the state wants to achieve. So it's important that the state uh, is actually involved in the creation of the protocols, the rules, the regulations, the governance framework, uh, and all a lot of the elements of the, um, the the stack, the tech stack, as it were. But the problem with the government is that the government 
is not. And, you know, I speak to government officials and they sometimes resist this, but uh, probably only half-heartedly, government is not good at innovation. Um, and if you really want to have services that are constantly innovating at the pace at which digital um, innovates, you need the private sector uh, to actually do that. And it's not just the innovation of the actual product, it's probably also innovation in in accessing the market, in uh, uh, you're doing all the other things that are required for the deep dissemination uh, of uh, a particular product. And I mean, the best example, of course, is India's universal payment interface. If it was the government building out an app, it wouldn't have reached a, a tiny fraction of the population that it is currently reached. And so uh, I think it was really important uh, to have private sector players, uh, you know, Google Pay and Phone Pay uh, in India, to actually roll this out at scale uh, in, in the country. And these two, I think it's quite evident, but why um, the philanthropic sector? Uh, and I think that there are certain circumstances in which you need entities that are neither burdened by the constraints of the private sector, nor uh, um, or, or rather have things that the, uh, the government and the public sector don't have. And that to me is in sort of the standard setting organizations. And there are two types of standard setting organizations. You need technical standards because you need these protocols to constantly be uh, updated, upgraded, uh, either to reflect new products that the market is demanding or to reflect new evolutions in, in the technology uh, and what technology offers. But also you need governance frameworks for each little micro sector within which uh, a particular digital public infrastructure uh, operates. And of course, you can have an entire government machinery spun up to do that sort of micro governance, but it would be extremely powerful uh, and more effective if you actually had sector-specific self-regulatory organizations work uh, to provide that level of micro-governance. And I think that is the role um, of uh, the philanthropic sector. Uh, essentially, uh, you know, entities that have a longer time horizon uh, than a, uh, a private sector company that's sort of looking quarter by quarter to results, but perhaps does not have... Um, uh, the, the the wide breadth that the government needs to be looking at at some of these things is sort of a halfway house between those two. And I think if you look at um, India's, uh, the various elements of India's digital public uh, infrastructure, there are these sorts of new entities uh, that are uh, quasi-government, uh, uh, have representation of uh, all the, the, the various sector uh, stakeholders, but which are operating from a non-profit basis um, that play an important role uh, in the development and evolution uh, of each individual DPI. And what would be an example of such an institution? So in uh, so there, there are uh, um, different types. I mean, I, I think if you look at the payments uh, ecosystem, NPCI is an entity that has some delegated authority um, uh, from the Reserve Bank of India to in a sense, regulate uh, the space. Um, but at the same time, they have representation from all the different types of stakeholders that operate within the space. Um, they have representation from the banks, the fintechs, they have representation from uh, you know, the third-party application providers. Um, and, and so that as an entity is uh, responsible, uh, in a sense, for the sector in a much more granular way. Uh, than the Reserve Bank of India, which is the overall regulator of the payment space. Uh, and similarly, in uh, you know, the, the DEPA, the Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture, which is India's data transfer layer, uh, there is a, a non-profit entity called Sarmati, which is, uh, in a sense, plays a, a coordinating role between the consent managers, between uh, the various entities in the financial sector, between whom data is shared. So these are two examples of um, entities that, that play an, an, an important coordinating uh, role, a, a facilitating role uh, in building out these uh, digital public infrastructure. Uh, and, I, and I argue that, you know, it is important to also have this in place because you can't expect the government to be getting into the weeds in the way that you need to get into the weeds, in the way that NPCI needs to get into the weeds as it comes up with new technology uh, infrastructure, new technology protocols. And as Sarmati gets into the weeds, as 
they try and onboard um, uh, new banks, uh, think about new products, and evaluate um, new forms of consent, uh, which is what they do on a daily basis uh, in these respective ecosystems. You know, in your book, Rahul, you devote an entire chapter to the potential pitfalls of the Indian approach. And you take that kind of previous abstract discussion that we talked about where we, we discussed the kind of risks of surveillance, of privacy, and so on and so forth, and you kind of ground it in an Indian context. And I'd like to ask you about some of these potential pitfalls. Maybe we could start uh, with the risk concerning breach of privacy. It, it seems like almost every day, maybe not every day, every week, we're hearing about some kind of data breach related to the leaking of Aadhaar numbers. Uh, co-win data collected during the pandemic uh, that has been breached, uh, and stories of the sort. Uh, you have a very interesting passage in the book where you acknowledge these reports, but you say that uh, much of the media coverage is pretty sensationalistic um, and, and leads readers to take somewhat mistaken inferences about how severe these breaches are. Uh, tell us why you argue in that way. So it, it depends on you know instance to instance. I don't I, I don't claim um, uh, to be able to an, to have actually answered every single uh, instance uh, of leaks. Uh, and, you know, and in particular, I speak about the Cohen uh, breach because as it happened, uh, I had already submitted uh, my first manuscript to the editor, and I had to furiously revise the manuscript to uh, take into account uh, this new breach that happened. Um, so the so the fact is that. When you're dealing with data um, and you're dealing with population scale data, there are many instances uh, and you know, just the fact that you are dealing with this level of population scale data, no matter what you do uh, to mitigate it, you do create opportunities and surface areas of attack. I think it's important to, uh, to be mindful of that as you design the infrastructure and be mindful of that as you operate the infrastructure. Uh, forever, for as long as you do it. But there are many elements of India's uh, digital design that mitigate against the really harmful risks. And I think um, I speak about a lot of them uh, in the design principles section. I talk about um, the fact that the uh, data in India is federated, which means that uh, for most elements of India's digital public infrastructure, there is no single honeypot um, of uh, information that people can attack and, and get access to. Um, and I, I speak about you know, the various mechanisms uh, that, are, that have been put in place uh, in order to prevent uh, these sorts of harms. And so with that background, if you look at the, uh, the Cohen uh, data breach, the newspaper reports seem to refer to a vast amount of data um, that, that had actually been breached. Um, they, there were screenshots of what the data looked like as I went into those screenshots, it was quite obvious to me that the data that comprised these screenshots had been put together, had been assembled, um, because it they, the, you know, the, the various fields had um, columns that don't normally occur in any one of these databases. But obviously, they'd been put together uh, in, uh, uh, in, in al almost an after-the-fact kind of way. Now, immediately what that suggests is that actually this is not a breach of the main database. It, the data is real, uh, but the data could have existed uh, in some other database and had been put together. And this, in this specific instance, uh, to me was uh, an indication of an overstatement um, of the actual risk. Now, once again, I don't, I don't want to uh, say that there have been no data breaches, that there has been no harm that is caused as a result of it. I think there have been. But in uh, case after case, when you look at it, it's in the hyperbole in which it is reported that the panic uh, and the, and the, the fear uh, is caused. Uh, and, and I think that there is a responsibility that we all have to, as, as we think about this, you know, as much as I am a proponent of this, I must in, engage and look at every allegation of a data breach because it could happen. But equally, the, the people who claim that there are data breaches have a responsibility to actually uh, look into how bad that data breach actually is. And you know, is it, in fact, the entire 1.3 billion uh, other users, or is it just one subset of that? Because there is a state that has some uh, other use of data in which the other number has been, uh, has been seeded, 
and it is just that smaller database uh, that has been written. And sometimes I find that there is um, perhaps less of that uh, that nuance and that detail in in the reporting, which is unfortunate. Let me ask you about another concern that people raise sometimes uh, about India's DPI approach. And, and again, you take this on head on the book, which is the question of exclusion. That is, people not being able to access benefits they are entitled to because the digital infrastructure has broken down in one way or another. Um, how worried are you that citizens, particularly poor citizens, might be left out of this sort of 21st century technology stack through no fault of their own because of infrastructure failures? Extremely worried. I mean, it just cannot be allowed to happen. We, we can't build digital infrastructure that leaves anyone behind. And I think that anyone who uses um, this approach, this, this digital public infrastructure approach, must start with the presumption that no one should be left behind. Now, having said that, the nature of any sort of digital transformation is that it takes time. As fast as digital is, as we roll out digital infrastructure, there will be elements of the population and, and ever-decreasing percentage, but still there will be a percentage of the population that is left out uh, for various reasons. It could be either that the technology hasn't reached them or it could be that, you know, infrastructure doesn't work that well. If you talk about digital technology, you're, you're actually talking also uh, about the underlying telecom infrastructure. And if you've got spotty tele telecom connectivity, uh, it, it just won't be able to work. And, and as a result, someone would perhaps not be entitled uh, to their ration or, or any such thing. And, and that's not acceptable. And so I think there are a couple of things. One is, uh, as we build this out, we have got to, particularly in the early stages, be cautious before we mandate that this is the way and the only way by which you can access services. You, 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 you should not uh, mandate such a thing until you are reasonably sure that the entire population uh, that is affected has access uh, and has the ability uh, to use this infrastructure. The second thing is that regardless of whether everyone has it or not, whether the telecom and technology infrastructure exists or not, whether everyone has smartphones uh, or not, whether everyone you know understands how to use a smartphone and you know i think it's not just connectivity but it's also ability uh, that we need to be thinking of you in all of these circumstances you must build your digital public infrastructure so that it can be accessed in an what we call online offline uh, kind of a mode other people call it digital physical and digital uh, kind of a mode and that may require you to build some sort of an assisted element uh, to the digital public infrastructure so that you allow third parties um, who perhaps are more digitally savvy to help those who are not digitally savvy or who, who live in areas where uh, the technology and connectivity is poor. So I think, uh, I, I th you know, the, in, in a recent um, conversation, someone told me that there are parts of Canada that still don't have electricity. Yeah, in the first world, a technology that's been now uh, that is now celebrating its hundredth anniversary or more, uh, we still don't have blanket coverage of electricity. Now, if that is the case, can we ever expect to have blanket coverage of the internet? Or, you know, uh, all all the Starlink and all, uh, despite all of that. So, if that is the case, then we must build our digital infrastructure in a way that acknowledges that uh, and mitigates that. Uh, and and I think that is um, I, so. So just to cut a long story short, there are many ways in which India has done that. Um, we there's a there's the extensive use of QR codes, so identity today, uh, the other identity can be authenticated using a digitally signed QR code. Um, there are many other online offline mechanisms that have been built into India's digital public infrastructure. And I think that anyone who does this needs to. It's almost uh, incumbent upon them uh, to take this into account as they roll out uh, this this new approach to uh, to digital transformation. I want to, again, kind of zoom out, uh, having kind of gone into some of the nuts and bolts of the Indian approach and ask you about what this means for sort of India's soft power or its role in the world, right? Because... 
on occasion, and and you and I were together at a conference uh, hosted by our colleagues at Carnegie India uh, in last month. Um, you will see government officials from other countries sometimes bristle a little bit when they're being sold the gospel of the Indian model, because in their hearts uh, they believe that uh, in their own countries they have pioneered their own stack, their own technology stack, their own DPI model, which maybe in some ways even better than aspects of the Indian approach, again, in, in their eyes. In comparative terms, how unique is the Indian approach, right? Um, and is there room for a thousand flowers to bloom? Absolutely. And you're absolutely right. I think, you know, we're closest to this model. And so we think that, you know, this is the only model. Uh, the wonderful thing about the G20 last year, India's presidency of the G20 last year was that, Many countries stood up and said, "Look, we've also built this, and it was it was wonderful to see the various flavors of digital public infrastructure that various different countries uh, have built and are currently operating. Some of them are very advanced, um, as you said. Some of them are perhaps better than India. Some of them on the ground have uh, more transactions, more you know, in terms of value terms, in terms of volume terms." And so, yes, there is. There are actually, you know, we don't even have to wait for it. There are a thousand flowers that are blooming uh, right now. I think what's what's uh, perhaps different about the India model is the full stack nature uh, of the India model. Um, I think there are very few countries that have actually fully exploited all three layers of the stack that I described. Um, some of them don't have access. Most of the you know the the developed world does not believe um, in digital uh, identity uh, for some strange reason. I think well, well maybe that's too harsh. I think. I think at this present point in time, they don't have digital identity, though increasingly uh, we know that countries are looking towards that. Many people have payments um, systems, um, and there are various different shapes and forms that that takes. A much smaller section have got the data exchange, the empowerment uh, layer. Uh, but certainly, uh, Australia has got the consumer data rights. Um, Brazil has got uh, a data exchange framework. Uh, and so it, you know it exists everywhere in the world and and so i think it's it, it, other countries are right to bristle when india stands up and says that we're the only ones who who uh, who have done this but it, to india's credit i think over the course of the of uh, the g20 um it it didn't it stopped saying that and uh, you know i think we started talking much more about the dpi approach and i think it's important to think about the dpi approach as something uh, different. Not that you know India has any uh, patent over uh, over this at all. It's the DPI approach is very much this public-private approach where uh, the the basic protocols, the basic design of the system, is rolled out by the government, and then the government, in a sense, gives its imprimatur over what it is, how it will work, but it is deployed by the private sector. And this particular model is not that common uh, around the world. Um, many of the countries have, that have built DPI have built it exclusively within the, the, the government domain, um, either because DPI is a way for the government to engage with citizens, and so the government feels, and perhaps it has the capacity as well, to roll these things out. Uh, in, in other uh, parts of the world, it's almost entirely private sector um, with just a very thin layer of supervision on top. I think what India brings to the table is just this, this uh, the, the experience of having done it in this way where this is much more tightly coupled than anywhere else in the world. That is a sort of an example that people can think about. I think those that are heavily dependent on the government can can look to this model and say, okay, this is probably a way in which we can leverage the private sector for the innovation that it will it could potentially bring uh, and i think i think that really is what india uh you to answer your question on soft power that really is india's soft power uh in 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 this area and and this sort of goes back to the very first question you asked me um which is this idea of techno legal governance i think you know this is all about really the governance of it, the systems. Uh, we can get vendors to build these systems, but if you get vendors to build these systems, you suffer from vendor lock-in and all of those other problems that come from giving one private sector entity, I don't know, control over your identity infrastructure or something like that. But when you do this tightly coupled public-private 
and also um, you know non-profit as I speak about the three uh, three legs of the stool as it were you start to get a much more robust uh, set of checks and balances um, that offer you a new and very direct uh, way to govern and, and regulate the sector while still getting all uh, all of the benefits I think you know, one of the lines that we've started using uh, is to build a infrastructure on which regulators can regulate and innovators can innovate. Um, and to have the same infrastructure on which both of these things uh, can take place is extraordinarily powerful. Rahul, I want to bring this conversation to a close by asking you a little bit about the future. Uh, you've been involved in this world for, for many years, probably more than, than you uh, want to count. Uh, as you look ahead, I want to ask you about the work that lies ahead. You know, we, we know about and we've talked about the sort of digital pipes, quote unquote, India's built, the platforms which have been built on top of that, some of the exciting use cases that we see around us. But as you kind of look out and say maybe the next five or 10 years, what is the next set of milestones you envision? for GPI in India? Well, if you're, if you're limiting me to India, I will be limited. So let me just broaden the, the question so I can get a broader answer. Sure. I think, uh, so for India, of course, we will, I hope, continue to look to different sectors and, and different areas in which we can roll out new variations of DPI. We'll, we'll look for different types of DPI uh, to build out. And I think there are a number of sectors in which this work is currently underway, and we will start to see um, different elements of that. But as a result of India's G20, a lot of countries have become interested um, in this DPI approach. And I think the um, immediate step post the G20 is to actually find a way in which we can enable these countries to actually adopt the DPI approach. This is not as easy as it sounds, because India has a lot of inherent advantages. It has a huge population, which means that it is much easier to roll these uh, you to amortize the cost of these things. Um, India also has a significant tech capability. Uh, and so, you know, India doesn't have to rely on anyone else uh, to do that. And I think uh, as far as other countries are concerned, in, in, in our discussions, we've, we've sort of spoken to countries with a population of, you know, less than 100,000 people. Um, and for these countries, they don't have the, the scale of, population that sometimes justifies the level of expense that some of this DPI will have. Uh, and they don't certainly have the technical capability that India has just, you know, homegrown. Um, and so how, the question then becomes, how do we help these countries go down the DPI approach? And there's a lot of really interesting work that's that's going on around offering DPI as a service. We're calling it DAS, uh, you know, sort of a, a variation on the SaaS model, but DPI as a service where you know, we can spin up cloud-based instances, cloud-ready instances of the various digital public infrastructure that a country needs and allow them uh, to access that without much investment in, you know, in, in either capability um, or, or any other digital infrastructure. So I think for the next five years or so, this is going to be really interesting um, as, we, as we roll out this, uh, this next level. And I guess finally, uh, and I know this is perhaps the subject of another book and perhaps uh, another episode of your podcast eventually, uh, I think uh, we cannot ignore the role that artificial intelligence is going to play uh, in the next decade. And, you know, I think we're already starting to say that even DPI and this DPI approach has its limits uh, when it comes to helping people leapfrog stages of uh, traditional development. And the way to then take it even further uh, is probably going to be through uh, the use of AI. Um, and so, you know, if you layer artificial intelligence and actually very specific use cases of artificial intelligence on top of the digital public infrastructure, we're going to find, you know, the next level of unlocking uh, that that uh, currently even DPI is going to butt its head against. And, uh, you know, we've got some sense of what that might look like. Um, but uh, I think that's really going to be the interesting work that we do for the next decade or so. My guest on the show this week is the lawyer Rahul Matan. His new book is called The Third Way, India's Revolutionary Approach to Data Governance. Uh, Justice Sri Krishna, who chaired a multi-year effort to draft 
a privacy law for India, said Rahul's book, quote, held my attention better than a mystery novel, end quote, which is perhaps the the the, the sweetest uh, words of praise one could hope for uh, writing a nonfiction a book like this. Rahul, um, it's a pleasure always to talk to you. It's a pleasure to read you. Thanks so much for taking the time and congrats on the new book. Thank you so much. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Grant the Masha is a co-production of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and the Hindustan Times. This podcast is an HD Smartcast original and is available on hdsmartcast.com. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to rate and review. It helps others find the show more easily. For more information about the show and to find the writing we mentioned on this week's episode, visit our website, grantthemasha.com. Tim Martin is our audio engineer and Mira Verghese is our executive producer. Thanks for listening and see you next week. This was a Hindustan Times production brought to you by HD Smartcast. HD Smartcast.